So in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at Canada's role as a middle power in modern conflicts. And for the purposes of this lesson, we'll be defining modern conflicts as those conflicts which have taken place since the end of the Cold War, so since about 1990. And in order to do this, we'll be splitting the lesson up into two major parts. Uh, first, we'll briefly talk about Canada's role in geopolitics as a middle power and discuss exactly what we mean by that concept. And then in the second part of this lesson, we'll be looking at five different case studies and be analyzing what Canada's role was in each of these five case studies. The first Gulf War, the Rwandan Genocide, the war in Afghanistan, the Iraq War 2003, and the Syrian Civil War. So to begin with, we'll look at this idea of Canada as a middle power. In the 21st century, Canada is often described as a middle power in international relations. And what this means is that while Canada is not a superpower, so like the U.S. is, Canada still has some influence over international issues and is looked to when other countries want to form military coalitions, provide peacekeeping in conflict areas, or negotiate trade agreements and peace treaties. So this idea of a middle power goes back to international affairs and international relations theory, that there's these different tiers of powers among countries. So at the top end, you have these superpowers or great powers. So this would be countries like the United States and China and Russia today that are very powerful. They have large militaries. They have nuclear weapons. They have powerful economies. They often have large populations. Um, and as a result of all these things, they have a lot of influence on the way the world works. Below that, we have these idea, this idea of middle powers. So this would be, Canada is a perfect example of this. We're not quite as big. Our economy isn't quite as big because our population isn't quite as big. Our military isn't quite as powerful. We don't have nuclear weapons like the United States has. However, we still do have quite a bit of influence on the way the world works. Canada is often looked to, uh, again, for things like peacekeeping missions. We're a part of many uh, multinational uh, trade deals. We looked uh, in the UN. We, we have a large role in the UN uh, with many initiatives going on there. So Canada plays a large role in the international community. It's not that we're isolated and not doing anything. It's just that we aren't necessarily this great, huge power that has the ability to unilaterally transform global affairs. So with that in mind, let's have a look at our first case study and see how Canada was involved in this conflict. We're going to look at the first Gulf War, which took place in 1990 and 1991 between Iraq and Kuwait, but eventually involved uh, several other countries. So a little bit of background on the first Gulf War. So we have the Iraq president here, this man at the side, Saddam Hussein. He was a dictator. He led Iraq from 1979 until 2003, and he was a ruthless dictator. So he, was an, he led an authoritarian regime. There were not free democratic elections, and he uh, suppressed the opposition with brutal force when necessary. Um, and, and minority groups in Iraq, there was discrimination against them. So groups like the Kurds, for example, they were, they were held back. Um, so, although Saddam Hussein definitely had many uh, opponents in Iraq, um, he was able to keep them in line and keep them in control because of his authoritarianism. And he was the leader of the Ba'ath Party. And what the Ba'ath Party stood for, it was a mixture of Arab nationalism and socialist ideas. Now, in August of 1990, Hussein claimed that the neighboring country of Kuwait was stealing Iraqi oil and used this as an excuse to invade the country. Now, Iraq had been in conflict with its other larger neighbor, Iran, throughout the 1980s. They'd been at war for a while, and at this point, um, they decided that they wanted to invade Kuwait uh, to go after their oil supply. The UN responded by demanding that Iraqi forces withdraw by January 15th. 1991. And when they did not do so, the UN authorized military force. And this is where Canada comes in. Along with the US and dozens of other countries, Canada declared war on Iraq and was involved in this conflict. The coalition forces quickly overwhelmed the Iraqis and they soon withdrew from Kuwait. The US did not proceed onto the capital of Baghdad, however, and this allowed Hussein to remain in power. The reason for this is that the UN's mandate was not to remove Hussein from power. The whole idea was that the violation of international law was that Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. 
So really all they wanted to do was get uh, Iraqi forces to withdraw from Kuwait. Once that was done, even though the U.S. did want to remove Saddam Hussein from power, they were not authorized to do this by the U.N. So the U.S. forces did not continue on. However, after the war, the U.N. continued to impose economic sanctions on Iraq, and they also continued to do routine weapons inspections. So this was to prevent Iraq from developing chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons of their own, which might make them pose a threat to neighboring countries in the coming years. And as a precaution, after the end of the war, the U.S. kept its many thousand troops stationed in Saudi Arabia as a precaution in case uh, Hussein ever decided to invade a neighboring country again. This was to sort of uh, try to hold that off. This was a deterrent by keeping these forces in Saudi Arabia, which was another one of those coalition countries during the Gulf War. So what we can see from this is that although Canada is playing a small part here, we definitely are part of a larger international effort here. So the UN had decided that the uh, invasion of Kuwait was against international law, and we have Canada not leading the charge to go into Iraq, but definitely following the lead of the United States in order to accomplish this larger goal. Our second case study we're going to look at here today is the Rwandan Genocide. So the Rwandan Genocide comes out of a civil conflict in Rwanda between the Hutu majority and the Tutsi minority. There's two ethnic groups within Rwanda. There's a very complicated history between these two groups that goes back to the colonial era when Rwanda was a colony of Germany. Um, during this time, the, uh, the Tutsi minority eventually came out uh, with a lot more power than the Hutu majority, and this caused a lot of tension between these two groups for many, many, many years. And a civil war broke out when the Rwandan president was assassinated in April of 1994. And what ended up resulting was a genocide. Over 800,000 Tutsis were killed during this genocide. So a huge, grave violation of human rights um, you know, on the scale of the Holocaust that we saw in World War II. Now, what was Canada's role in this? So Canadians were already a part of a UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda. Rwanda had already had civil conflict for many years, and the UN had decided to send a peacekeeping force to Rwanda to try to keep the peace. And this was led by a Canadian, General Romeo Dallaire. However, when tensions started to escalate, uh, the UN did not escalate their mission. So the idea is that peacekeepers are there to keep the peace. They're not, quote, peacemakers. And this is an important distinction. When we talk about peacekeepers, um, they can only be effective if there's already a truce, if the peace is already there. They're there to sort of help the conflict remain peaceful. Um, you can't send peacekeepers in. They often aren't armed, or if they are armed, it's with only small weapons. They aren't there to force a peace upon groups. They're there to keep the peace. So when uh, this genocide started happening, um, Dallaire and his forces felt like they couldn't do anything to stop the genocide. And it's important to also note here just how quickly this genocide happened. Like, uh, over 800,000 uh, Tutsis were killed, and this is something that escalated over the course of weeks and months. So even whereas the Holocaust happened over the course of years, this was happening in an even shorter time scale. So you can just imagine the uh, scale of this. We can see in the picture here at the bottom with uh, Romeo Dallaire, and he's inspecting these are the skulls of victims from this genocide. So here, again, although Canada is participating in the international community and doing its part to try to maintain the peace, there's only so much we can do. One of the biggest challenges that was faced by the UN peacekeeping force at the time is that the United States, which is a member of the Security Council in the UN, um, did not want to send in troops. They didn't want to escalate this conflict further. So although Canada was pushing in some ways to try to uh, prevent this genocide from happening, we weren't able to convince the Americans to do more. And um, the failure of that is, is looked upon as you know one of the big failures of, of foreign policy during this time, that we allowed this genocide to happen or to keep going on. We didn't do as much that we maybe could have to stop it. Our third case study, we're going to look at the war in Afghanistan. So before we get to the war in Afghanistan in the early 2000s, let's have a look a little bit of a look at the background of uh, politics and military conflict in Afghanistan, because that's important to look at, too. 
it by no means has, was Afghanistan a peaceful place before the U.S. invasion. In the late 1970s, the Afghan government was overthrown by rebel groups. However, the Soviet Union supported the uh, communist government there. So we had a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the late 1970s to try to prop up the socialist government. And if you remember back to the Cold War, we had this idea of proxy wars that were fought between, although it wasn't the U.S. and the Soviet Union fighting each other directly, they would kind of pick sides in a local conflict and support these, uh, these groups to indirectly fight one another. And so this is what happened here. So the U.S. ended up backing the rebel groups, including the one that was eventually run by Osama bin Laden. And eventually these rebels forced the Soviets out of Afghanistan. And then there's some kind of interesting parallels here between the Soviets in Afghanistan and what happened to the United States during the Vietnam War. And what the result of this was, was that a group called the Taliban took control. And the Taliban instituted a radical Islamist government that dramatically restricted the rights of citizens, particularly women, and enforced a theocratic religious law over the country. Another piece of background information that we want to understand here is the founding of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda. It was founded by Osama bin Laden in 1988, and it was been described as a, quote, stateless, multinational army. Uh, terrorist groups in many ways kind of challenge our notions of sort of what an army is. So a group like Al-Qaeda um, does not operate within the borders of one country. So this isn't like during World War II, where the United States could declare war on a particular country. Al-Qaeda is not a country. They operate in many countries. They're a stateless army. So this makes it uh, more challenging to try to deal with an, an, an enemy such as, such as Al-Qaeda that we'll see when we get into uh, later parts of this lesson. And what Al-Qaeda promoted was an extreme, violent interpretation of Islam. So they called for um, violent attacks on the West. And they wanted to establish fundamentalist theocracies throughout the Muslim world. And sort of the culmination of all of this was the September 11th attacks. So on September 11th, 2001, four planes were hijacked over the United States. Two were crashed into the World Trade Center in New York City, and another in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and another one crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. Um, it's believed that the fourth plane was also destined for Washington, D.C., and it was either going to be flown into the White House or the U.S. Capitol building. As a result of this, uh, 2,753 people were killed, including 24 Canadians, and soon afterwards, Osama bin Laden claimed responsibility for the attacks. And it's important to note here just how dramatic of an impact these attacks had on the American psyche. Um, again, this is 10 years after the Cold War has ended. Um, the 1990s, in many ways, were a lull in sort of foreign policy, and the U.S. didn't really have an enemy to, to fight at this time. Um, for, for 50 years, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were, you know, locked in this, uh, this Cold War with one another. But the U.S., as a result of that, was able to uh, sort of focus its foreign policy to being anti-communism, anti-Soviet. Once the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the U.S. didn't have that opponent anymore. So some have described the 90s as sort of an aimless foreign policy that the United States had. They didn't really know where to focus their attention. And so this idea of uh, terrorism, it, it's not that it was not on their radar at all, but it wasn't necessarily their entire focus. There, were, there was lots of different focuses. They weren't sure if there were state actors that they should be focused on. They weren't sure if maybe they should focus on things like organized crime groups. Um, and then terrorism was this other sort of, um, this other subset of groups that uh, U.S. intelligence agencies were looking to focus in on. But in many ways, it, it was hard for the U.S. to imagine an attack like 9-11 happening, a non-state group carrying out a terrorist attack that killed this many people. It just wasn't on the radar of American intelligence groups, to the point that um, only weeks before the September 11th attack, there were intelligence reports that were sent to the White House that said Osama bin Laden is determined to attack the United States. And they described how he wanted to use planes to fly them into buildings and kill many, many people. 
um, and U.S. intelligence agencies kind of dismissed these claims, or the, the Bush administration in particular dismissed these claims and thought that they were um, you know, too far-fetched, that they wouldn't ever be able to pull off this scale of an attack. So it really did come out of nowhere. The other thing, too, is this idea of planes being hijacked. Um, prior to 9-11, there were hijackings of planes, but never before were planes used as weapons in this way. Before this, terrorists might hijack a plane, but usually what they would do is they would land the plane and then demand a ransom. So they would, they would get paid money, or maybe they would exchange the hostages for political prisoners being released. There wasn't this idea that the terrorists would use the planes in a suicide bomb. So that was another thing that kind of shocked people, that they weren't able to sort of foresee this happening. So this really changed the way that people thought of potential um, dangers coming out of uh, you know, these smaller groups. And we see an immediate change in American foreign policy as a result of 9-11. So we see the president, George W. Bush, declaring a war on terror. And again, this is a complicated idea because unlike other wars where you can declare war on a country and you know where they are, you know where their borders are, you know where, what their army is, you know their army, they wear the same clothes, they you know fight on a battlefield. Terror is different. Terrorism is more of an idea. Declaring war on an idea is more difficult than declaring war on a country. So as a result of that, um, you know, the war on terror has presented many challenges to foreign policy in the past uh, 15 years. Now, one of the first major initiatives of the war on terror was the war in Afghanistan. After September 11th, the Taliban government refused to reveal where bin Laden was hiding. He was in Afghanistan at the time, but the Taliban was providing cover to him. As a result, the UN gave permission to the US and its allies to invade Afghanistan to track down bin Laden. And in October 2001, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien announced that Canada would join the invasion, and within days, Canadian forces were on their way. And as a result of the war in Afghanistan, the Taliban were quickly overthrown. Within weeks of the US invasion, the Taliban-led government is ousted from Afghanistan. By 2004, Afghanistan had democratic elections and a new constitution, and new rights were given to women. However, this was not without a cost. Throughout the conflict, 159 Canadian soldiers were killed. Now, this is important to note because this is the highest total of uh, Canadian soldiers killed in the conflict since the Korean War. So it's been 50 years since this many Canadian soldiers have been killed in the conflict. It's also notable that three women were killed during this initiative. So this is the first time that women are seeing frontline battle roles in the army in Canada. It cost the Canadian government $18 billion. And although Canada ended its combat role in 2011, some Canadian troops do remain behind in the training role, and there's still guerrilla fighting in a civil war that continues to this day in Afghanistan. So there still are Taliban forces um, with an insurgency that are fighting against the uh, current Afghan government to try to regain control of parts of Afghanistan. Um, and this is, again, a conflict that's still ongoing to this day. And so some other pieces of aftermath of the war. So we have the civil war continuing in Afghanistan. We have continued drone strikes in Pakistan. So the U.S., particularly under Obama, um, began this aggressive campaign of trying to kill terrorist leaders, not through traditional uh, armed forces, but by using unmanned drones, like you see in the pictures here. So these are flown remotely. There's people in the U.S. who are flying these uh, machines halfway around the world, and then they they you know they'll shoot a missile and they'll take out um, their target. Now this is this presents many problems because uh, a Often it's hard to find these terrorist leaders just off in the middle of nowhere by themselves. So one of the criticisms of drone strikes is that they have a high a collateral damage. So often family members of these terrorist leaders are also killed. Um, and one way that this the sort of number of, of terrorists that are killed might be inflated because one thing the U.S. has done in the past is that when they're counting the number of terrorists killed by a drone strike, They'll include any males of uh, fighting age, so any male between the age of about 16 and into their 40s, they, they consider those to be terrorists, whether or not it was proven that they were 
um, you know, part of a network or they were part of the conspiracy or they were working for a terrorist group, they include all those men the same. So whether they were collateral damage or not. Another major uh, impact of the war was the death of Osama bin Laden. So in April 2001, um, a Navy SEAL team went and found bin Laden. He was hiding in Pakistan and had been hiding there for quite some time. Um, and bin Laden was killed and his body was eventually um, given a burial at sea after this uh, operation had taken place. Our fourth case study here today, we're going to look at the Iraq War of 2003. So after September 11th, the U.S. President George W. Bush turned his attention back to Iraq, where Saddam Hussein remained in power, and Bush accused Hussein of having weapons of mass destruction and connections to al-Qaeda. So he was accusing Hussein and saying that he had been trying to build nuclear weapons. He was stockpiling chemical and biological weapons, and also insinuating that Saddam Hussein might have helped plan September 11th. Um, both of these claims were later to be proven to be untrue. There's no evidence that Saddam Hussein was building a nuclear weapon. There's no evidence that Saddam Hussein helped to uh, fund 9-11 or plan 9-11. Um, this is, it's been proven, was based on faulty intelligence gathering. There was an informant that um, some U.S. intelligence agencies were relying on who was giving them bad information. And this was only one source. Many other sources were saying, you know, what he's saying is not true. And that was kind of ignored. It's been argued that the Bush administration had an agenda to invade Iraq no matter what, that this was one of their goals even before 9-11 happened. Um, in fact, there's stories of once September 11th happened, even after it was clear that this was done by Osama bin Laden, even after it was clear that bin Laden was not in Iraq, he was in Afghanistan, in those initial meetings in the days after September 11th, um, when Bush met with uh, his generals, they were still discussing, well, how could we pin this on Saddam Hussein? How can we turn this into a war against Iraq? So pretty clearly, this was a foreign policy goal of the U.S., that they wanted to remove Saddam Hussein from power one way or another. So it's, and in some ways, they used September 11th as an excuse to do this despite the fact that there was no connection. And so here are our main players that we're going to look at in the Iraq War. we got in the middle there U.S. President George W. Bush. On the left, we have British Prime Minister Tony Blair. And on the right, we have Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Now, the U.S. government tried to get U.N. approval for military intervention. And initially, they got weapons inspectors to go back into Iraq to look for nuclear weapons, to look for chemical weapons, to look for biological weapons, and they found nothing. And the U.S. said, well, that's because they're hiding them somewhere else. This isn't enough. We need to invade. The U.N., though, did not support this claim. And they said that, you know, we have not shown us enough evidence. We cannot support invading Iraq at this time. Despite not having UN approval, in March of 2003, a coalition of U.S. and British forces invaded Iraq, and within weeks, they toppled the Iraqi government. In 2006, Saddam Hussein was captured and executed, and democratic elections were held. However, due to the lack of a UN mandate, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien decided not to support the war, so Canadian troops were not involved in this version of the Iraq war. So again, here we can see, despite the fact that the U.S. and Canada are major allies, Canada still has a role to play in international affairs. The Prime Minister decided that there wasn't enough evidence to risk Canadian lives and send Canadian troops into this conflict. So even though we weren't able to persuade the U.S. from uh, you know, engaging in this operation, there is still this kind of back and forth that goes on here. Canada is still independent enough in its foreign affairs that we're not just going to listen to the U.S., we were still able to make up our own mind and decide what to do on our own. And in this case, Canada decided not to get involved in that. Now, what was the aftermath of the Iraq War? Well, despite the fact that the Iraqi government was quickly toppled, there was a local insurgency that quickly formed, and for years afterwards, um, they fought against U.S. troops. And in total, 4,491 U.S. troops were killed in the conflict. Again, a huge number numbers not seen since the Vietnam War. This also led to lots of regional instability. So not too long afterwards, we see lots of gov other governments toppling in the Middle East. We have the Arab Spring that happens in 2011, 
And we also see the formation of groups like ISIS, terrorist groups that come out of this. Um, in fact, so ISIS, uh, many of their fighters were actually former Ba'ath Party members and members of the Iraqi army. When the Iraqi government was toppled in 2003, the U.S. general at the time decided that the best course of action was debathification. So he was looking back to what happened to Germany following World War II. And what happened there was there was denazification. So Nazi leaders were put on trial. Anyone who was a member of the army, they had to you know, renounce their... They were charged with war crime in some cases. They were stripped of their um, their rank. They were fired. Same thing happened here. The entire Iraqi army was fired, and anyone who was a member of the Ba'ath Party was, you know, arrested. This caused lots of problems, though, because now the, you're starting with your entire government and your entire military from scratch, from square one. So that caused lots of problems with training this army to fight off this local insurgency. And it also created lots of, you know, disenfranchised, unsatisfied, angry young men who were former members of this army. Um, many of them ended up joining ISIS. So we see this almost as a direct consequence of the U.S. invasion in many ways. And our finally, final case study that we're going to look at here is the Syrian Civil War, another conflict which is still ongoing as of 2018. So a bit of background on the conflict. It began during the Arab Spring, which was a revolutionary wave that swept parts of the Middle East and North Africa in 2011. Syrian President Bashir al-Assad refused to resign, however, and this led to civil war amongst many factions, including the Free Syrian Army, the Islamic Front, Hezbollah, ISIS, the Syrian Army, Kurds, as well as other small groups. A U.S. coalition became involved in a limited role to, su to support some of the rebel fighters who were fighting against the Syrian government starting in 2014. And beginning in 2015, Russia provided tactical support to the Assad regime. So we can almost see, some have compared this to some of the proxy wars that we, we saw during the Cold War with the U.S. and Russia picking sides. And as of January 2018, the conflict is still ongoing. One of the most significant consequences of the Syrian civil war is a huge humanitarian refugee crisis that has resulted. Um, as of an estimate in February 2016, the UN estimated that over 13 million Syrians required humanitarian assistance, with close to 5 million seeking refuge outside of Syria. While most refugees sought asylum in neighboring countries such as Lebanon and Jordan, there were also huge waves of migrants seeking to uh, go across the Mediterranean into Europe through Greece and Turkey. So this created a huge flux of migrants into Europe during this time. Now, what was Canada's role in this? Now, Canada briefly provided limited air support in missions against ISIS targets, but they stopped flying these missions in 2015 when the Trudeau government took office. There are still Canadian troops who are involved uh, in some roles of training Kurdish resistance troops. And perhaps the most significant way that Canada was involved in this conflict was by accepting over 30,000 refugees beginning in late 2015. So again, here we see Canada, again, in our middle power role, taking on a variety of ways of trying to deal with this conflict. So the U.S. Um, you know, is not involved in a full-scale invasion of Syria, but Canada briefly provided help in terms of their, their limited mission, in terms of providing air support and, and targeting ISIS uh, targets. But also maybe a bigger way is in accepting these refugees, these people who have been displaced because of the war, bringing them in and giving them a home when there really was nowhere else for them to go. So in summary, in the 21st century, Canada has emerged as a key middle power in international affairs. While middle powers usually do not have the power to unilaterally influence world issues, they play a key role in helping to solve various international events. And since the end of the Cold War, Canada has played a variety of roles in several military conflicts.